Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Compass here live on Cotidiano TV. Today in our weekly talk show, again, about a very unusual plant pathogen agent, about an absolutely fascinating topic, the tobacco mosaic virus today in a pluridisciplinary approach with uh, Professor Dr. Christina Wege. Uh, she's the head of uh, the uh, research unit of molecular and synthetical plant virology at the Institute of Biomaterials and Biomolecular Systems in Stuttgart. Christina, welcome to Compass. Hello. Then... Uh, my next guest is Professor Annalisa Kahlo from the University of Barcelona, the Institute of Bioengineering of Catalonia, IBEC. Christina, you're an expert in uh, microscopy. Yes. And Professor Alexander Bittner, uh, Ikea Basque, Basque Foundation of Science from Bilbao, Spain. Um, Alex, um, you're an academic researcher from Icago Basque, as I said, and also like uh, the other two distinguished guests, author of, uh, as author have contributed to the research of uh, this topic, the tobacco mosaic virus, and also, if I'm not mistaken, its binding affinities to, to copper, to uh, inorganic materials. Welcome once more to Compass. How are you doing? I mean, all Thank of you, you have accepted joining this yeah, interview we enjoy having early this in the morning about the tobacco <laughs> mosaic virus. Christina, you are a virologist. Yes. Uh, Annalisa and Alex, they are more covering the nanomolecular aspects in chemistry and physics oh, of the yes. tobacco mosaic virus. Sure. Christina, tell us, please, what is your approach to the virus? Um, Please let us know in which areas the future technologies and very highly sophisticated areas of research we encounter the tobacco mosaic virus. So I think I have to state that Alex and me, I think the the knowledge or, or getting to know each other, even you created this part of research. Originally, I'm a plant virologist from a molecular point of view, working on interactions of viruses with the plant and working on the very economically relevant um, Gemini viruses, which are very important plant pathogens especially in warmer parts of the world. But then when Alex came to Stuttgart, um, well, in the end of the 1990s, we uh, decided to work together because um, we noticed that there were a lot of very interesting potential uh, modifications of the virus that could lead to applications. I think we were among the few people worldwide starting this research, but we were not the only ones. That's also very important. There are other teams in the US uh, who also discovered that there should be a lot of possibilities. And so we started our initial collaboration on inorganic um, um, uh, modifications of the virus and perhaps Alex can go into this a bit deeper in a moment later about metal deposition and using the virus as a template for producing very very fine nanowires and so on and also working on magnetic um, ferrofluidic um, issues and so on and in recent years I changed my work more to the um, biological modification of the virus, meaning that we um, assemble it into new shapes like kinked particles. Originally, it is something like a tube, a, a small nanotube, but now we also can change the, the by use of um, viral components or virus-like components, not only the proteins, but artificial RNA and new, new shapes, and also um, equip them with functional molecules like enzymes, antibodies, and we are also collaborating a lot um, with other teams. A lot of this work is very interdisciplinary and uses the virus as a structural, fascinating building block, which can be modulated a lot. But we can go into this deeper. And I think- um, Of course. It would not have been working with Alex, and then later um, Annalisa came into the team and <laughs> added very nice additional spices to it. <laughs> yes. Annalisa, I came across your name uh, together, yes, Annalisa. Uh, in a very interesting and remarkably interesting article, Nanoscale Wetting of Single Viruses. And as, a, as an expert in microscopy, I'd kindly ask you, Annalisa, to explain us what is your approach? What makes microscopy, what sort of microscopy 
was so relevant in investigating basically how the tobacco mosaic virus behaves in water and what are its properties. Yes, so I am a chemistry a chemist by by formation, but uh, I have been interested so much in uh, in a special microscopic technique, which is called atomic force microscopy. So um, this is a very used setup in nanotechnology. Actually, I think it has been one of the instruments that really uh, made the, the nano worlds closer to, to us in a way. Uh, it uses a very um, small uh, lever in the micro size, it's just called cantilever, which has the capability to, um, to deflect once it touches a surface, uh, or in this case, the surface of a virus. So uh, by measuring this deflection, you can get a lot of information on different materials. For example, the height of the object that you are touching, but also uh, the softness, the mechanical properties, and eventually also if uh, there is any water absorbed on the material. But we are really talking on uh, eventually one nanometer layer of water on a uh, four nanometer high object, like it is the, the tobacco uh, mosaic virus. So actually I was very fascinated by this structure because actually the tobacco mosaic virus is a, is a tube of uh, maybe 300 nanometers in length, but uh, it is uh, just four nanometers in, uh, in height. And within this uh, small structure, there are a lot of uh, interesting uh, uh, periodicities and uh, characteristics which are given by the, the protein structure of, of the virus. No, it is arranged into a um, uh, helical shape. Uh, you have different pitches, uh, different periodicities along this length that you can appreciate. But if you really try to investigate this with microscopy techniques, really it is difficult because many microscopes, including the electron microscope, cannot really get into this structure um, clearly. You really, to, you have to process a lot of the images uh, uh, correct for many artifacts. And in the end, you don't know if what you get is really the physical structure or is it's just the results of many artifacts that you have been adding doing uh, this uh, heavily processing. So what I wanted to do uh, was a direct inspection and see if I can uh, sample this, uh, the different modes of operation of my atomic force microscope to really see uh, the virus structure first. And this is something that we obtained working with Alex. So we uh, developed a special mode of operation of the atomic force microscope to really be able to appreciate the helix terms in the virus without any processing, uh, just by direct imaging of, of the virus. And this was nice. And then also what we try to do is also to um, uh, systematically change the, uh, the water content in our uh, microscopy chamber and see if we are able to get some information on the ice and also on the, on the structure of, uh, of the water uh, absorbed on, on the virus. And... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, tell them. You, you... I said, uh, actually, uh, the initial idea, I believe, was that uh, the epidemic spread of uh, many viral infections are, first of all, mediated by the environmental conditions. And this is already something new. I think very, very few uh, physicians could imagine that the environment that environmental conditions, and particularly those influenced by the ambient humidity, play a key role in the spread of a disease. So your contribution is an extremely important one also to provide this knowledge, this valuable information and help for a better understanding how pandemics, for instance, may spread. Yes, eventually. Yes, the thing is that because we were thinking that the tobacco virus lives more in a, in a dry or, uh, you know, ambient environment, not in the sea. So we were actually trying to change uh, the, the level of humidity um, in a deliberate manner, uh, in a way to, to be able to see what happens in the shape, uh, in the size. Uh, and if we are really able to, because in a previous work with, uh, that I was doing with my microscope, I was able to distinguish uh, crystalline water from amorphous water on top of surfaces, but really we are talking of one, two nanometers layer of water. So two uh, multiplied by 10 to the minus nine meters of water, just few layers. Uh, and this, uh, I was able to find a kind of proof of ice-like structure on an inorganic surface. And then we try to move to a virus and say, okay, let's see what happens if you are able to catch something like that in a virus. And what was the move to Alex? 
Uh, yeah. <laughs> Alex, right. what was your move, if I may come now uh, back to you regarding the tobacco mosaic virus? You are looking at this virus not as a virologist, uh, as an expert in uh, uh, in nano in nanoscience. This virus offers both perspectives from a virology perspective and from the perspective of an expert in nanochemistry and nanophysics. Your microphone is cut off. Your microphone, we cannot hear it's a, you. It's a bit difficult. Um, That's one fine. of the things that, that we all find fascinating, especially those who are doing physics, mathematics, also some chemists, is the symmetry of the viruses, um, which is always beautiful and attractive. And this is also one of the reasons why, in my opinion, one of the reasons why many people in physics and in chemistry got interested in tobacco mosaic virus. And by the way, also, of course, in many icosahedral viruses, other viruses, um, this was not so much the functionality, the ease of operation, stability, and so on. It was first and foremost this beauty and the symmetry, um, which now, for my personal research, is not as simple um, a story anymore. Um, Coming to the other aspects, one of the fascinating aspects is for sure of tobacco mosaic virus, the stability and the ease of modification, chemical modification. That was one of our driving forces to look for um, various um, derivates and, and um, hybrids with inorganic um, objects such as metal layers, metal particles, oxide particles, and so on. Um, but nowadays, I personally see that very critical, this, this part of research, um, because there are many alternatives, um, and nanotechnology has made enormous progress. Just um, two days ago, Nobel Prize on nanoparticles, we can now make, and I think everybody can easily make nanoparticles with fantastically high definition and a lot of um, um, functionalities, you don't necessarily need viruses. Viruses still have some advantages, others it doesn't have. I then like coming to your question you about the... <laughs> yeah, we have a, we have a big yeah. argument about that. That's science, of course. If science, science. everybody agreed on science, it would be very boring. We have a big argument, especially me and Christina, on that for many years. That's why the collaboration is approved. <laughs> As for your um, question on the transmission, the transmission of plant viruses, of course, there are multiple pathways, but it's always, from my simple point of view, much, much easier than mammalian viruses. Mammalian viruses have many different stages of their life, if you call them a life, life cycles, in which they can change their shape, functionality, everything to an extreme amount, and plant viruses normally don't do that. So indeed, when we work with plant viruses, and when you think of infecting a tobacco plant, Yes, you're thinking more of the pathway through the inorganic environment, through the air, through the soil, and so on. But if you work with, um, or if you talk to people working with mammalian viruses, people think in a different way. And that was, in my personal opinion, one of the problems in, in the um, uh, pandemic, uh, in the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, that the transmission through air was um, underestimated and is still being underestimated. Um, because with mammalian viruses, you think of different entry pathways and of different infection pathways. And the research also is very much um, concentrated on medical aspects, I would say. And this is luckily different with plant viruses due to their high stability, maybe. So what, what I like to disagree with, I, I agree with most you say, Alex, but we, we also enjoy being struggling in a scientific way. And um, I fully agree with you that there are a lot of species of nanoparticles that have a lot of uh, properties easy to produce or sometimes tricky to produce uh, by bottom, uh, by top down approaches. But the ease of plant viruses comes from the fact that they are produced um, by themselves. Sustainable is a very trendy word now, but it is important to produce green materials in large amounts which you can harvest from plants and which are not pathogenic or toxic this is uh, to, to humans and to animals at all of course they are harmful to plants and therefore we also have to take care that they they are not spreading all over the world although they are doing so the plant viruses they are everywhere but uh, one has to try to counteract epidemics as they occur but nevertheless these types of particles they they are really um 
easy, um, avail easily available in very large amounts. And um, they are they can be modified by technologies which are more like biochemistry and by um, genetic engineering as well. And I think this is where the problem comes from because of the public acceptance of gene technology to some aspects, because um, there are a lot of mutations of the virus all around the world which exist. And uh, we um, need a few mutations in the virus to make it easily um, to be coupled, for example, with functional material for bio medicine and so on. But um, these genetic engineering uh, approaches, they are for the tobacco mosaic virus very, very advantageous if you want to use them, for example, as a contrast agent uh, for, for imaging in biomedicine, or you need it if you use it in a, in a biosensor for um, immobilizing a lot of biosensor um, units um, or, or recognizing analytics units on the virus. And there are a lot of modifications which um, are working much better if you use genetically engineered viruses and they are not accepted as being um, more or less safe, although every scientist is sure that they are not harmful. But therefore, it is mostly China and um, the US where this type of research is going ahead very fast. And in Europe, a lot of people are a little bit um, refraining from this part of research because nobody knows if it really can get into practical terms. Although there are some approaches now of inactivating the viruses for technical purposes, so you can use them from plants without being infectious anymore. And I think there are ways out. And some people are really working on synthetic viruses. And we also are working on viruses which are assembled with non-infectious RNA. And so these ways may be out of, um, uh, out of the dil dilemma with the public um, yeah, opinion you know. about this. Just to give you a very, yeah. very quick um, idea of, about our controversy. Sorry that I'm leaving out Annalisa now for a for That's okay. the <laughs> no, no, I already have a question for Annalisa. Very quickly, <laughs> one of the, our biggest achievements we are very proud of, and that was very much recognized. We made wires of metals, copper, nickel, and so on, only three, three to four nanometers in diameter. So only something like 10, 20 atoms in diameter, very long. We thought, hey, that's fantastic. That's you can only do that with tobacco mosaic virus and similar viruses. Just a year later or two years later, people made gold wires much longer, much thinner, much easier without any virus, <clears throat> just by templating with um, with a kind of soap-like molecule, for example. There are advantages and disadvantages on both sides. And Christina, of course, is right with the genetic engineering. We have a huge advantage on tobacco mosaic. Virus, but there's now so many strategies that again, yeah, the Nobel Prize just uh, days ago was big, a big and very nice example of what is possible with purely chemical approaches. So, yeah, they're fully different. I think nano quantum dots, as they have achieved the Nobel Prize, they're a completely different type of material. So I think we, we should not mix up soft matter nanoparticles from biological origin and inorganic chemistry made particles here. So I think it is really a soft matter type of particles, which is also biodegradable. Mm. And it has a lot of very different properties from- No, uh, I know you're talking about the product. This was only about the synthesis. Yeah, yeah how you make particles yeah you can template them with the virus but there are also many other strategies and um, just fantastic what is possible well, I'm, and, you know. alex sorry for interrupting you i honestly i came across a paper um, uh, published by several faculties of the university of lomonosov about gold nano wires produced uh, with the genetically obviously modified tobacco mosaic virus and that was like Reading that, that was like alchemy. I asked myself if the stories about transformation, which the alchemists pretended to have pursued when they got uh, persecuted by the church, were really speculative or if they had a point. Because you know what connects the dots. And I, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, pass uh, also the, the idea to Christina. Uh, in a poem written by Kanta, by the very famous French uh, writer and poet, Raymond uh, Reynaud Quinault, 
in the 40s, he associates the tobacco mosaic viruses with something out of crystals, because you know, I'll come uh, uh, back to you <laughs> to the crystals, the origin of evolution and something which is guiding the transmutation and transition. <laughs> and well, look, I'm not a scientist, but we have gold nanowires, we have uh, a philosophical approach during the Inquisition and we have obviously something guiding a transition. And a virus which kinosis could be seen in little, with a light microscope, in little colorful crystals, like in a kaleidoscope. Christina, how do we connect the dots? It's a virus inspiring philosophers. It's a virus inspiring, inspiring writers. It got your fascination as a, as a chemist. Have you ever seen with a light microscope these crystal structures? How can they be seen and where could they be seen? So so viruses, let's let's start with the with the with the occurrence of viruses. I think that they have been underrated strongly during the last decades. I think there was a period um, when plant and also animal viruses were much more well known and now they are, it is like a renaissance at present because novel technologies, they find viruses everywhere. That is very important to state. So there are people working now with next generation sequencing technologies. And um, I knew a lot of people from the area of Gemini virus research and they are, for example, looking into the ocean, into um, very ancient areas of glaciers. They are looking in in um, in glaciers, which are um, where there are holes inside, which have been kept um, away from the environment since thousands of years. And viruses are really, really everywhere. And I think they have a very important role in also in the gene transfer from one organism to the other, which is called horizontal gene transfer or lateral gene transfer. Transfer. They can exchange genetic material, not just between generations, but there are very <clears throat> well uh, investigated examples now that genes can be transmitted from one organism to the other by viruses in a very short period of time. And I think, therefore, uh, the fascination of viruses is now again back in science because also epidemics like COVID have shown that the power of the viruses is really high. Um, but also, as you say, in arts, they have been very important also. Um, perhaps people know the, uh, perhaps you know, and other people know very well the tulipomania when they have been changing the shape yep. and flowers of plants. And so so I think viruses, they, they have inspired artists and now they are coming back to perhaps novel um, recognition. But unfortunately, research on viruses is going down worldwide at universities. That is perhaps another issue. Anneliese, tell us, please, it looks like art looking in the microscope and seeing these crystals. Is this uh, reminding you, Anneliese, of art? Uh, to me, yes. I mean, uh, when I every time I see with my microscope something which is uh, everything, actually, from crystals to part of cells, uh, uh, bacteria and viruses, uh, actually, uh, to me, the shapes that you can see at the nanoscales are, uh, I mean, are sometimes very nice, amazing. And uh, actually, it is also exceptional what you are able to see. Uh, the fact that um, eventually what you are seeing is something which is very, very small. And eventually, an optical microscope is not able to, to, see, to see the same. And the and, crystals uh, of the tobacco mosaic virus? Actually, this, I, um, in my experience, I didn't see it. What I saw was... Um, single viruses connecting on each other, eventually doing this long, long thread. Uh, it, it was uh, interesting to see that uh, they both like to align in a way. So you form really nice layers, which uh, eventually is a monolayer, just one, uh, one plane of viruses that connect laterally on each other. But also sometimes they like to connect uh, one next to the other. So this is a more structure that could uh, resemble a, a long cable eventually being the building block for a for a I mean a template for a for a wire a nano wire um, but very interesting is that uh, sometimes you can uh, actually as I was mentioning by using specific uh, more much more detailed approach you can really start to see that uh, the telix that shaping within a virus so and this is something that um, it's at uh, really the limit of what we are able to see nowadays with a, with a microscope 
even not in the optical field, eventually more, but uh, it's really exploring the ultimate resolution of high resolution microscopes, because you, you can imagine that this spacing among um, protein shell is, uh, is uh, less than one nanometer eventually, one or two nanometers, I think. And this is uh, and this is really powerful. Then you, when you see this, I mean, you are working something. with well suspended viruses, but the the shape of the crystals, I think, they can be easily seen. And because um, if you see these images, they, this is a book. Uh, I I just have to look up the the, the um, exact publication date. I think this is nineteen fifty six. And these are, for example, crystals of a polio virus, which are really crystallizing. And this is the same also. And even the book. Have a look. At that time, yes. they were they were able to do photos like this so i think microscopy and now you have great no novel technologies for showing individual particles but right. virus, this is a single virus this exactly. tobacco mosaic virus and i think they they really do the crystals in the in the um like like uh like flat crystals they're fiber crystals they're called they are not good crystals of the tobacco mosaic but they can be seen and they sometimes um, are even seen in leaf material if you cut a leaf and have a look it is a diagnostic issue because certain viruses including tobacco mosaic virus they they crystallize inside the cells and you can see them like the uh, bright colors but of course you're fully right with your technology going to the individual particles you, you cannot see them with a light microscope we can uh, we cannot you can do with your technique yes correct i i guess your uh, the crystal you are talking about are more uh, many viruses organized in three dimensional space that eventually uh, get to the size uh, that uh, an optical microscope can can appreciate right yes nice <laughs> yes Welcome also just now, Alex, also to aspects of crystallizing uh, the tobacco mosaic virus. Briefly, if you could, uh, or any one of you is welcome to tell us then also something about Stanley and why Stanley was so relevant in crystallizing the tobacco mosaic virus. He got awarded with the Nobel Prize for that. But before that, um, Annelise, I'd like to start with you. You mentioned uh, 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 about in this paper, nano weighting and viruses. Um, about the uh, the dry and humid air condition. Why is this relevant? Maybe you and Alex, since you both have uh, uh, written this paper, how does humidity impact the spread of the tobacco mosaic virus? And how does this virus behave at certain temperatures? Alex, you want to... No, I, I could I could say something on that. Yeah, I would say con compared to other viruses, there's really a very little influence. Um, we know that especially TMV, we can uh, store under completely dry conditions and it stays effective. That's not true for all the viruses. There's some viruses, for example, influenza that uh, thrive or are very effective at intermediate humidities, not very high, not very low. It's quite surprising. Uh, with TMV, it really doesn't matter. It can be completely wet, completely dry. It will be infective, so it stays intact. The structure stays intact. Um, um, that is, um, I would say, typical for simple viruses and plant viruses. We have only a strand of RNA and proteins, code proteins. We have not more. We have no lipids here. We have no sugars. It's one of the simple most viruses, and that's one of the reasons why it's drug. One of the reasons. The other is for sure that it has to survive the passage through the air, through clouds, through the soil, whatever. And so um, it, it was not surprising that we didn't find a huge influence. What we did find, though, and that's um, Annalisa, where um, her special um, AFM methods come into play, um, we verified one suspicion we had long ago already that the dry virus has a slightly different when we talk about the crystal, we cannot really talk about TMV because it forms liquid crystals. These are aligned rods, not really three-dimensional crystals, as physical chemists call a crystal. Um, but if you look at the virus itself, of course, there's this fascinating helical symmetry. And traditionally, and when you work at high humidities, you will find it also. There are several methods, like X-ray methods, X-ray diffraction, where you can find exactly that this symmetry is precise. And when you dry the virus, we had long ago already the suspicion there was something wrong. We found something, we first thought these were artifacts. 
So the surface on the nanoscale didn't look absolutely smooth, didn't look perfectly helical. And this is what um, Annalisa with the special method was then able to analyze in detail. And we found that the dry virus in fact changes a tiny little bit the structure. This is something that we know from mammalian viruses, they can change their structure to an extreme extent. For example, influenza is more or less like a more or less a globular structure, um, which has a lipid um, um, skin, a lipid outer skin. When it hits epithelial cells, it can become kind of filamental. It looks like Ebola or like tobacco mosaic virus, just very large. And then it rolls around, it's a cylinder, and it rolls around on, uh, on the cells until it binds. So an extreme amount of shape change that we for sure cannot see in, in simple plant viruses. What we saw was a very, very tiny uh, structure, Annalisa, you can explain. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, yes, as I said before, you, uh, we yeah. were uh, we were seeing this, Alex. But actually, it, interesting, interestingly, when you when you start to increase the the humidity, it's um, I mean, you lose a little bit this uh, this structure. At least uh, uh, observing this with uh, with the microscope I'm working with, um, and uh, and sometimes you measure a different height. This is what this microscope is very good at doing, you know, measuring height of of nanometric objects. And then we were a little bit confused if uh, this the difference in height can be uh, due to water absorption that makes the virus a little bit bigger, or uh, what is happening at high humidity. Why we don't see that. Um, the technical structure uh, anymore and uh, actually we were able to see that uh, okay topographically the virus is a little bit higher with high humidity okay this makes sense but uh, is this water or uh, water is on top of the virus where it goes and uh, in our paper we saw um, on, a, on the scale of few viruses really uh, the water agglomeration where it goes but this is just uh, the the corners or the um, uh, the, um, the angular uh, the angles between viruses that tend to be regions where water accumulates in droplets. But then, if you really uh, go on top of the virus uh, with uh, with our cantilever, we were able to see uh, the the water which is really on top of of the virus. Actually, it doesn't accumulate in the in the corners and uh, in this um, on on the surface. Let's mm -hmm. say I think eventually can be also inside and making the virus swelling. This is something that we cannot uh, uh, distinguish the two situations. If there is just water on the surface or water inside that makes everything a little bit bigger or fatter. Uh, but, uh, and uh, we were uh, also, we were trying to see which would be the structure of this water on top would be more ordered and does indicating uh, and more ice-like behavior, more amorphous. And uh, but I guess that the region of uh, temperature and uh, humidity that we were able to explore were actually clearly indicating that our conditions were uh, having like having liquid water, a very one nanometer layer of uh, of uh, liquid water um, till uh, hundred percent relative humidity. Um, please. Explain the following. I came across that at a certain point of your uh, experiment, you looked at the capacity of the tobacco mosaic virus still to bind water at only 20% humidity. I mean, which is, I would mm. say, rather very dry air. So it, it seems as if this virus has a capacity to collect water. To yeah, uh, let me. Uh, go through it because I have a feeling that uh, we start seeing something like uh, like this uh, swelling and this water absorption. I think around 50, 50 60 percent relative, if I'm not wrong. Uh, that was a uh, check for for the paper, right? Uh, it starts with RH and it goes down to twin. correct. Is it 20? Correct. We have three conditions, actually. Yes, from, one of uh, the conditions, I think, I took the lowest, I think, is 20. From 56 to 100%, eventually. Um, also, there is, okay, there is a 10%, a figure, okay, there is a figure uh, which is very technical, and maybe eventually uh, uh, we show some curves. And actually, I would say that there there is um, no much of an. Uh, it's more like um, the few uh, outmost atoms uh, 
of the protein viruses that interact with our probe. Not but once the water is on the surface, could we say that it binds water? Could it have, let's say, in soil, the capacity to extract water from the soil, the tobacco mosaic virus? Correct. Alex. There are many. Oh, okay. Oh, so, sorry, Annelies, and also but Christina. Me, I don't know, binding, but imagine the be... tobacco mosaic virus as a pathogen agent in a certain quantity able to produce drought. I don't think it's enough in the soil. So the amount of virus is not relevant in this regard. I think it has a hydrophilic and hydrophobic uh, patches on the surface. This is well known. Alex has also shown some models of this in our um, in our publications. And uh, although they are not based on our data, the models, to be honest, the 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 the, the models they they are based on the structural analysis of the virus, which have been starting um, already more than a hundred years ago, and which have um, a very detailed um, explanation for the fundamental structure of the virus. All atomic um, locations of the virus are very well known due to research starting from crystallography of the virus and now going on with cryo-electron microscopy and frozen but native state of the virus. So the structure is very well known. And therefore it is clear that on the surface there is um, uh, hydrophilic and hydrophobic regions in, a, in distances of let's say 2.5 5 to 3.5 nanometer from each other. And this is a nanostructured surface, which can, of course, be wetted at certain areas in a very, very uh, narrow pattern, probably. And therefore, I think uh, for sure it can be wetted. I think Alex can much better explain this, but um, the amounts of virus um, you you have um, in, in the soil, you, you don't have... Okay, I, 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 I accept that the quantity of the virus in the soil is limited. But given someone would have 20 kilo of, of, of enriched tobacco mosaic virus, could it produce drought? Applied I mean, what, a lot of research, what you have, what you came yeah. across, Alex, in its properties to the way it behaves in water and the mm -hmm. way it, 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 uh, uh, it covers itself in water on its surface, could it have an impact on soil in a very speculative scenario where we say, yes, let's say there are 20 kilos of tobacco mosaic virus. Could it impact and produce drought? Theoretically. I can't, theoretically. I can't really imagine that because when you have the viruses, you must also have the plants that produce them in nature. And even if there's only a small amount of plant virus material, which might be so hydrophilic, it will be much more than the viruses. For sure. yeah. So yeah. this is very unlikely. We have recently um, studied some um, similar effects on models of influenza and this is in my view from the results that we have much more effective because influenza is a complicated virus it has a, a code that is not only lipids but it has also it's glycosylated so it's covered by sugars and these sugars generally sugars are very hydrophilic much more hydrophilic than than um, uh, tobacco mosaic virus so in, in these mammalian viruses, if they are glycosylated, and most of them are, you always have something like a sugar coat that is very watery. Um, so generally, just think of sugars or even polysaccharides, maybe maybe not cellulose, but other sugars. They are much more hydrophilic than viruses they can catch water much more effectively, and they're abundant. Mm -hmm. And so other biostructures are even more suited. So I, I think if you if you want to have a bio a biomolecular complex or some some particle, you would choose some other particles which are ad absorbing. You can use pollen, for example. Pollen grains they they can attract a lot of water, or there are also crystals and certain bacteria that are very hydrophilic. And so there are much better systems in biology with, that can absorb water, like super absorbers. Yes. I don't know if there are biological super absorbers. Um, Annalisa, Alex, you are chemists because the super absorbers which are used in the nappies for children they are they are chemistry and they can catch um, really liters of water in a very small amount of powder but i don't know if there are biostructures 
similarly suited to this, but viruses for sure, they are not, not spectacular in this case or not, not really special. No. I also agree with Christina, honestly. I have a feeling from my experiment that I was able to change, increase humidity, reduce humidity, and the, the virus was going back and forth in this sense, but it was not a, a, like a big sponge of water. It's, it, it, for example, in our paper, we try to simulate uh, our virus behavior with something which should be eventually a, just a tubular shape. Any Every material, uh, just for that shape, we were able to reproduce uh, uh, the experimental results. So eventually every tube, which uh, has the same size of a virus, same, uh, same uh, diameter length, uh, but of every material could do uh, possibly the same job. But the virus itself, and I think this is what you showed nicely, Alex and Annalisa, the viruses, they are different also compared to influenza and other viruses. Some of them enjoy having water for being transmitted to other organisms and others, they are better transmitted to other organisms if it's dry. So I think it is a very, very um, fine balance you need to have for every certain virus to really keep it, let's say, active in a way that it can be produced by other organisms. That is what Alex already mentioned, that viruses are not living, so they rely on other organisms. And so they need the correct um, conditions to be transmitted to other organisms um, or to be activated um, in the organism. Of course, they also need to be un yeah. uncoated and to the genome to be released in water. This depends on the, on the liquid of life, of water. <laughs> But um, back to the initial question, you investigated the water binding affinity, am I right, of the uh, tobacco mosaic virus. And your findings suggest that it does bind water. Am I correct? Is that actually uh, the key message, Alex? Well, it's the, the key message of what we did was more the structure, the nanoscale structure exactly. of, of the water, not so much the... So the fact that it binds water was known long ago already, yes. And in, the, in, in that way, it's not at all surprising. No. That it was also, so you're looking at the nanostructure of the water and observed in this, uh, conducting that in uh, this research, that it's also it also has a property to bind water. Yes, but binding not in the, in the traditional uh, meaning Since. of chemistry, not a covalent binding. Yeah, because for binding, sometimes we mean that there is a really a, a chemical bond between water eventually and the surface of the virus. And we don't think this is the case. We think it's more a phenomena of absorption uh, driven by some interaction, which are non-covalent, means uh, non -binding. Um, binding um, kind of it, hydrogen bonding or uh, uh, binds, bondings that can be uh, broken and are more dynamic than a chemical bond. In a way, attachment, you could also say, perhaps. And then we must not forget that this is a helical structure. So we have an internal channel, mm -hmm. which is also very hydrophilic, which is which yeah. must be also containing some ions that normally is overlooked by um, in, in biological research, but also by many structural biologists. The, the channel is highly negatively charged. So there must, must be, when you dry it, also cations. <clears throat> so that means if you have a little bit of water, the channel must be filled with a kind of salty, special salty solution of water. And that we can, we could not investigate. This is what AFM can normally not do. It We cannot look inside. So we are very sensitive to the surfaces, but not inside, normally not. And there are very few methods that would qualify for that. We thought a lot about that, and we didn't really come to a good conclusion. But you started and, um, some work on the on the transmissibility of water through the channel, yeah. and this is also so that several that it is a question you quite often get from other people. Well, could you use it as a tube, like for drinking <laughs> in, on a yeah. nano scale? And some people even have shown that you can include some some um, some therapeutic compounds into the channel of the virus and use it for the delivery, for example, of of um, anti-tumoral agents or of contrast agents just by 
infusing it into the channel and therefore some research on this is very attractive to better understand it and it even is shown that it can diffuse between the code proteins to some extent and you also Alex did some modeling with some some people how much water can really pass through the channel so this is still an area which is um, difficult to investigate and I think you are on a nice way to get uh, deeper into this with your novel techniques Annalisa and also Alex in, in both your teams um, but this is a very, very uh, challenging area of research from a biophysical and um, bio and, and physical chemical point of view. Yes, we have said that basically the spread, and this is where we started, may be influenced by humidity. Is that correct? So obviously, uh, water condensation might then uh, deliver such nanoparticles, viral nanoparticles into clouds and fogs, and then the wind might then uh, promote the spread of such clouds, which contain viral nanoparticles, which then by rain may get mm -hmm. down to the, to the soil. Um, we've spoken several times about literature. I need a bit of contribution of my own, and literature is something easier I can access than, <laughs> than your sophisticated and very complex area of research. Uh, we have a poet, not a very famous poet, but a former very famous politician, Churchill. And uh, Churchill and the flu. Uh, at the age of 15, he published his first and only poem in his life, Influenza. And that was 1890, in the middle of the Russian influenza. Now, that was a pandemic somehow similar with uh, COVID, like Professor Bechet from the Institute uh, of the Pasteur Institute in France is suggesting and uh, also a similar uh, pandemic with the Spanish flu, but this is a different topic. Now, in this poem, Influenza, Churchill refers to meteorology and to weather conditions. So obviously, you know what, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, and flies like a, like a duck must be a duck. And I'd like to, uh, to quote from this uh, very, very short poem uh, called Influenza. Oh, how shall I its deeds recount or measure the untold amount of ills that it has done from China brightest celestial land, even to Arabia's thirties sand, it journeyed with the sun. Its powers to kill was over and with favoring winds of spring, it left our native shore. So, um, well, philologists, they interpret all sorts of weather conditions, but apparently there was, there were, there was a dry weather condition of uh, uh, this time. How would have a dry weather condition influenced a viral spread or a spread of nanoparticles? Does it rather spread with humid or with dry weather conditions? When we look at pandemics or epidemics, we have many factors that we as um, biologists or physicists, uh, chemists don't see. like, for example, uh, what you easily overlook when it's cold, you're inside. So you're squeezing many people inside. That was the same 1918, that was the same 2020, in, especially in the winter. Um, and that's the same we have right now over Europe. We have some viruses going around, same thing. Um, this is one very important aspect that we are overlooking and not discussing here. Um, but when you're looking just at the spread, there's there are two types of viruses. Um, one of them, and influenza is typical for that, they are seasonal. And um, a big part of the seasonality I just discussed, and the other part of the seasonality is temperature and humidity. So in our northern hemisphere winters, we have um, lower humidity. And here in San Sebastian, I'm in San Sebastian, not in Bilbao, by the way, we feel that a lot because we're at the sea, it's normally very humid, and in winter, it's more bearable with lower humidity. But that means also these are favorite conditions, especially for influenza. It's known it has been tested and with, um, with I think, with um, hamsters in cages, that there is an aerosol transmission, which is optimal at 5 degrees, low temperatures, and at surprisingly low humidity. 30% humidity. You would expect from such a complicated virus, complex that it's hydrated and that it likes very high humidity. Not too high because if it's too high, it will collect water and become a microparticle and fall down and not spread like an aerosol. 
But this 30% is for me very surprisingly low. I would have expected 60 or 70 percent. And this must have been one of the reasons also 1918. And it was probably one of the reasons 2020, which we don't know because this um, the SARS-CoV is still a very new virus, not very well characterized as compared to influenza. Um, so yes, temperature, humidity, but of course also airflow that that all must have played a role. That's that's no doubt. But let's not forget about the um, the other aspect of of winter that we have. But and the other viruses that are not seasonal, they simply don't seem to care about that. And to my knowledge, not very much is known why they're not very temperature. They are, but not very temperature or humidity um, um, uh, sensitive. Yeah, but we should now clearly distinguish between plant viruses and animal infectious viruses here. That seems important to me because I think for the behavior on the surface of the viruses, they might be very nice models, plant viruses in some regards, although most of them don't have a membrane and there are several um, a lipid outside. There are some, but um, but most plant viruses are like those viruses of animals that do not have a lipid outside. Most don't have, but they uh, were as the animal viruses, they can be transmitted by um, internalization through through just breathing or just by uh, depending on the virus. Everybody knows some are transmitted by blood contact and so on. But plant viruses, they really need to be um, in, uh, in to get into the plant either by uh, mechanical treatments. So if they are in the clouds, they won't infect any plant. This is just a side effect. You need to either um, cut the plant or to break some hairs, which is the case, for example, in tobacco mosaic virus, which is mechanically transmitted. You transmit it just by, by very, very minor, um, yes, uh, yeah, uh, hurting the plant surface, for example. And most plant viruses are transmitted by insects and by, by um, other organisms in the soil or just by sucking insects like aphids and so on. So it means they really need to get into the cells and into the tissues first. And this is an important difference because their cells, they don't have receptors, which then lead to inclusion by vesicles of the viruses, which is often the case with animal viruses. So I think they have nice models for this stability and for the reaction towards uh, humidity, but they're safe to work with because they don't spread by themselves into the next plants if you keep them out. <laughs> Annelisa, what is your point of view regarding this um, uh, last question which I had? Well, um... Yeah, I mean, I think I, I agree that I think we have a very big landscape of viruses and uh, and infection mechanisms eventually are not uh, are not so clear. Uh, but I'm I would say that eventually uh, you you mentioned this the water um, uh, I mean the accumulation in droplets the all the circle of of rains and clouds. Uh, but eventually, also the 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 contact with surfaces eventually can can play a, a role, right? So not just the, the way they are uh, into the the air the air, but also the their capability to absorb on surfaces and being a vehicle because people touch touch yeah. each other and uh, and this this kind of things may may also play a role and may may be mediated by water as well. Well, touching it, and this is the last aspect, uh, if I may say, um, for the remaining couple of minutes till the end of this uh, interesting discussion. Uh, in the 70s, uh, British scientists have investigated the amyloid fibrils, uh, which uh, cause Alzheimer. And Ericsson invented in this paper from, I think, 1972, they compare this protein structure, which is inducing Alzheimer with the code protein of the tobacco mosaic virus. Now, the funny part is that at a certain point, all the discussions about a link between Alzheimer and tobacco mosaic virus disappeared as if no one has ever spoken about it. Um, and they basically, uh, what they say, and let me quote, is a protein, well, about the amyloid fibrils, also a sort of uh, uns uh, unsoluble structure, almost like a crystal, let's say. Um, they've said a protein related to the subunit structure of human amyloid fibrils. At the structure of amyloids, you are saying, 
the actual structure of amyloid in situ is not clear yet. Tentatively, it can be considered as a helical coil consisting of regularly arranged protein subunits of approximately uh, 13,500 uh, mol uh, WD, whatever this unit may be. Each turn of the helix consists of about five protein subunits. This arrangement could be reminiscent on a different scale of that seen in the tobacco mosaic virus. Mm. This arrangement is like that seen with reconstituted tobacco mosaic virus and really in a native virus. And uh, in this paper, they present three scenarios what uh, are the, uh, 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 the, the reasons for, for Alzheimer. And uh, they do say that uh, identification of a possible protein subunit, an approximate ultrastructure and amyloid fibril suggest several possibilities in regard to cause the pathogenesis of this disease process. One, that the protein of amyloid fibril represents the tobacco mosaic virus coat protein. Touching it, other scientists say that nose popping, uh, sorry, nose picking is a risk for Alzheimer. Now, given one would touch this tobacco mosaic virus in nature, grab it from the soil, have it wherever on a surface. To be honest, I, 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 I don't like such scenarios which are not really uh, scientifically proven because you can also argue there are a lot of other structures in nature which uh, which form um, helical fibrils from uh, from proteins. For example, the cellular skeleton, just the microtubules, they, they also look like a helical fibril out of proteins which are self-assembling and uh, or self-organizing in this case, better to say, and I think um, this is the one example which resembles a bit the shape, but also collagen is a is a collagen, yes. helical yes. structure of protein. Yeah. So you find a lot of structures of helical protein shape. And if there was no, so there has also been a debate about aluminum, yeah. aluminum ca causing um, Alzheimer, and I think this came out to be some some correlation which did not work out uh, because it was some artifact in the lab. So I don't know the study, but I would be well. Very it's cool. You find it written by sorry by Earl Bendit and Niels Eriksson from the Department of Pathology, University of Washington, communicated by Shield Swaran and read before the Academy on the 12th of October, 1965. And that yeah, was I published. I wouldn't exclude it, but I think there needs to be a very, very, it is very difficult to do such type of experiment. You cannot do experiments with humans. So this is an ethics issue. Uh, and um, I think um, you should, in that case, uh, take into account many more different. So the hypothesis could be interesting, but I think it contributes to a way of um, correlating things with each other, which are not causative, um, which cannot be proven to be causative. So it could be a very interesting way of thinking, but I think it causes fair at people who eat uh, tobacco viruses every day, which um, probably is not really um, going into a direction which is very helpful. So I, I would not say they are not right, but I think it is um, can even be dangerous to argue this way and not to also mention the other opportunity uh, possibilities that perhaps other uh, molecule complexes could behave similarly. So to me, it is a bit like, um, I wouldn't like to, to, to have this on the table without watching from different perspectives and arguing is it a correlation perhaps or can we ever prove it so there will be mysteries in life which nobody can ever solve but um <laughs> we we should not make people anxious about no 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 that's around. not my intention at all yeah. i mean yeah, I yeah. never <laughs> thought about tobacco mosaic virus in food and I don't care. But we thought about it ourselves. We always discussed, Alex and me, how does it taste? <laughs> because we also thought perhaps a plant which is uh, infected with the virus tastes different. So nobody mm -hmm. ever did so. <laughs> well, it has uh, uh, the aspect of, an, uh, of, a nutri of its nutrition properties. I think that was investigated 46 Okay. It has growing properties for animals and it contains proline. And once it contains proline, it, it may influence the production of oxytocin. And then it may, at a certain amount, also influence one's thinking and making him not more feeling scared at all of viruses. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>
Okay, so we have the tobacco mosaic virus in animal growth. And well, it does contain a large proportion of proline. But we also have the, a large I would be really careful in interpreting too much and using the, um, this beautiful structure for too many things. Then yeah. I have worked a little bit with amyloids and um, I, I have to say, I have to, to, to have a look at the papers that you mentioned. I was, I was saying it to me that right is a completely wrong conclusion. So, for example, if you want to make an amyloid, you can take insulin, which is a more or less helical structure, a bit of disordered also, uh, not disordered, sorry, uh, not much ordered. And if you put it in an acid, it will rearrange into a beta sheet, which is typical for amyloids. And actually, that is also known. So if you have people who have to inject insulin in their belly, at the point of, uh, of injection, amyloids can form, amyloid plaques made of the insulin. But these people don't have Alzheimer's. So this is not in the brain. Uh, you can refold so many proteins from alpha helical to beta sheet. So the beta sheet is what is the amyloid structure. This has got nothing to do with the TMV. And TMV, it's even the opposite. It's very difficult to leave the alpha helical structure. There's practically no beta sheet. There are very small amounts of beta sheet. So I think if I had if I were looking for an example for an amyloid protein, this would be one of the last the last. One of the last. There are some synthetic proteins that are made to make extremely stable helices. They would be a little bit worse. But the packing of tobacco mosaic virus with these four alpha helical sheets that are densely packed in a kind of package of four helices, this is very difficult to crack up. So um, I, I really don't see any relation to, to the typical amyloid structures. And um, also, we have to be a bit careful because you said that amyloids cause Alzheimer's. This is an idea that is not yet proven. Not proven. We yeah. still don't know where Alzheimer really comes from. There had been also this aluminium hypothesis, I think, which is not disproven. I'm not sure. Many other things. It could be that this is like hen and egg. This is a consequence of the um, of the cells developing. Uh, um, or, or developing in, in uh, this process that leads to the plaques in the end. So we see these plaques of amyloids, but they're maybe not the cause. There might be the effect. I don't know. The, the opposite dynamic, yeah. Could be exactly the opposite. I'm not sure. I'm not an expert with that. But um, to link it to tobacco mosaic viruses, to me, from my point of view, from the chemistry, completely wrong. I'm sorry. Yeah. I will send you all this paper published. Uh, yeah. Uh, in the end, at the end of uh, the 60s, and why they make this association between the tobacco mosaic virus and uh, the amyloids. Christina, Annalisa, Alex, we came to the end of uh, this discussion. Thank you very, very much for having participated here in Compass. It was a great honor to interview you. I hope you enjoyed uh, our yes. discussion and that you've seen each other you've been, you all have been knowing each other for many many years and thanks to compass <laughs> you came again in contact with each other to engage in such a discussion thanks to you thanks a lot Radu. thank you very much nice. wishing you all a nice day uh, greetings too. to stuttgart greetings to barcelona greetings to bilbao and all the best and wishing you lots of success in um, your research and that may also come in future again together and co-author such brilliant papers which are extremely useful for better understanding of nature and whatever occurs in nature. Thank All you. All the best. Thank you. Thanks, Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.